Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar, Top 7 Capabilities for Next Gen Master Data Management, sponsored today by RELTIO. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, AJ Kana and Aaron Zorns. AJ is the Vice President of Marketing at RELTIO. His technology expertise stems from various leadership roles at large public enterprise software companies, including Viva Systems, Oracle, Kana, Progress, and uh, Amdocs. He holds an MBA in Marketing and Finance from Santa Clara University. Aaron is the founder and chief research officer of the MDM Institute. Prior to founding the MDM Institute, he was founder and executive VP of Meta Group largest research advisory practice for 15 years. Aaron received his MS in Management Information Systems from the University of Arizona. And with that, I will give the floor to Aaron to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. Now that I'm off mute, <laughs> that was fun. Okay, so today we have a great topic. It's what's next. You now it's the new year. It's time to think about resolutions it's time, or, or revisiting resolutions. It's time to think about what do we want in our MDM package over the next several years, our MDM solution, our master data management, and governance-related software. So that's the topic of our one-hour session today. I'll do about 30 minutes as an industry analyst to bring together some of the high-level concepts and trends, technology trends and business trends, and then A.J. will give us some use case examples uh, from his real-world experience. And then lastly, we've saved 10 or 15 minutes at the end for your questions and answers. You're encouraged to, again, pop them into the Q&A window. And uh, Shannon will moderate those for us at the end. So let's carry on. So the MDM Institute, some of you may not have heard of us. Uh, been around 15 years, basically. We work with very large companies to help them work on their requirements for master data management, reference data management, and data governance. We help them do their, um, their pricing, their negotiations, their reference checking, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we have 150 large companies that are our council that get free unlimited consulting to that effect. And as industry analysts similar to Gartner and Forrester, by the way, my company, Metagroup, was acquired by Forrester 15 years ago, which is when I spun off to do nothing but master data management. Uh, was acquired by Gartner, I should say, my company, Meta Group. So as an industry analyst, what I do is I also take positions, just like a stock analyst, and I say something's going to happen in the next one to two years, here's what you need to do. Uh, something's going to happen in the next two to three years and three to five years, and here's what you need to know and what to do about it. Okay. So next up, uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see some of those companies, uh, international companies, some pro bono work we do with Doctors Without Borders uh, companies, but mostly very large corporations. Uh, Westpac, the very bottom one, is the seventh largest bank in the world out of Sydney, Australia, and so on and so on. And um, I do work in both San Francisco. I have two homes, San Francisco and Munich, Germany, and so I work out of both. So the top seven capabilities that we're going to discuss today, we're going to look at cloud, we're going to look at microservices, we're going to look at graph, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, action enablement, and then information or data governance. And in particular, our thought here is that all enterprises need to focus on what's next because our current crop of widely installed MDM platforms, the IBMs, Oracles, Informaticas, et cetera, some might even call them legacy systems, uh, they were not designed with digital transformation, the digital enterprise, et cetera, in mind. And so we've had to sort of patch things together the last five or so years to really get there. And in particular, the notion of system of record as a master, your golden sample, your customer 360, uh, to add also something called system of reference, and likewise to get us into system of engagement, where we're keeping track of uh, the actual uh, transactions and their complex relationships among the transactions and among the consumers and citizens, et cetera. So, we're going to be looking at relationship-driven analytics more and more. You hear that word a lot, cognitive applications, everything in context. And that's what we really need to do is to have 
MDM built into our systems or available as microservices to our systems so that we can take that dream, that uh, target that we're future state looking for, the digital enterprise, that basically everybody, uh, uh, markets, governments, et cetera, all need to do this. Now, cloud, of course, has been around a while. And again, I apologize for the analyst speak, but the text you see on this chart is basically an analyst strategic planning assumption from the MDM Institute. And what we're saying is that the small to medium businesses have definitely picked this up, and also the large enterprises to do some of their MDM. Okay, now smaller enterprises tend to do this because of cost, because of labor, uh, the ease, et cetera, whereas the larger enterprises are looking at scalability and power among other things. Okay, so partly why this has been very attractive, we all know is because you, know, you pay as you go as opposed to a big lump sum of several million dollars, you can get away with several hundred thousand a year, et cetera, et cetera. Likewise, there's challenges, though, when we look at how do we do federated architectures or blended architectures, you know, uh, the, co, the, uh, the co-terminus type where we have both on-premise and cloud. And then we've got private cloud and public cloud. How do we bring this all together in terms of an organizational architecture structure, et cetera? And then we've got other areas where native cloud, as opposed to things that were, you know, um, uh, as we say, shift and replace, just simply moving an app into the cloud, you know, doesn't do it, or or a system piece of software doesn't necessarily cut it. You know, being designed with cloud in mind, not just cloud pricing, but uh, you know, overall the mega vendors, IBM, Oracle, Informatica, SAP, are still struggling because with with cloud, because in particular the pricing model takes a huge cut to their earnings. Okay, whereas they're looking at um, a much smaller upfront payment, even on an annual revenue recognition model. Uh, it's it's a challenge for them to get there. And so it's, it's put a lot of stress on the large vendors in particular. And we're also having challenges with, uh, you know, I won't say run amok, but sort of the uh, the Wild West cloud approach where organizations functional and enterprises functional organizations such as sales or marketing or research or engineering, customer service will go off and buy or rent their own cloud apps. Okay, and then we have that challenge where Salesforce, SAP Business by Design, Workday, uh, success factors, you know, trying to bring all that together is, is a challenge, okay? And at the same time, you know, privacy, not just because of California Privacy Act and not just because of global data protection rigs, but also because the fact that it's, it's, it's a huge expense and loss of market uh, capabilities, you know, and, and financial fines, et cetera, when we have these privacy intrusions or hacked systems. And so, we really have to look closer at how well MDM being the, the keeper of that golden data, okay, um, how it addresses, addresses privacy and security. Okay, and that's an ongoing challenge for most organizations as well as the vendors. Okay, and then reference data is perhaps an exception. You know, those static tables of codes, uh, ISO codes, um, uh, ICD, uh, International Classification Disease, the various industry standard codes and private codes within your company, those tables of codes, those are something that do definitely fit into a cloud model. Uh, that's something that definitely works and, and is low risk in terms of putting out there on the cloud for sharing. So our bottom line thought is that cloud economics are very compelling, but they're challenging both for customer, employee, and, and citizen data, but they are a key sales enabler. Um, they, they do allow all of us to move into MDM easier in terms of a test bed, in terms of an evaluation model, and in terms of delivering. But at the same time, there remain technical challenges, and likewise, even business challenges, getting business out of some of the Salesforce um, installations, managing multiple hierarchical orgs across multiple discrete Salesforce implementations in your large company, for example. Now, microservices is another thought of the seven trends that we'd like to talk about. And in particular, microservices is basically deconstructing. When you think of a deconstructed taco or, or whatever food, it's the same thing here. We're deconstructing MDM down into its granular components. And of course, it's various degrees of granularity. There could be components such as high-level components, such as uh, order to cash, or uh, onboard new customer, or resolve a telephone conflict, uh, et cetera. And then there could be the very micro um, CRUD type, create, read, update, you know, just simply insert or read or update or delete, okay? And so what we're seeing is that MDM and data governance, which are often blended together 
in a, in a software vendor's uh, package or solution or platform, MDM and data governance are increasingly deconstructed into these components, into these microservices that are executable as, as web services and, and, and other capabilities. Okay, so when we see that, then that starts getting into the, into the space of some of the mega package vendors like SAP, Oracle, et cetera, uh, N4, where we see that, you know, the basic functionality that MDM is providing in data governance has historically perhaps been the domain or bailiwick of an application package. So we've got a little bit of that going on, not to mention business process management and its new um, hype cycle type um, name, uh, robotic process automation, RPA. Uh, so those are also something that has to be thought about when you look at the, the core functionality of your, your next generation MDM. Now we're seeing that graph, uh, just to insert graph here, graph here a little bit, also provides a lot of the capability to crosswalk across these uh, micro components or microservices, as well as across domains. We're gonna talk about graph more later. But basically the thought is that data-driven or MDM innate, that is something that has MDM built into it rather than as an afterthought, um, the market science of that is gonna exceed that for you know, the raw MDM platform software. And so when we look at microservices in terms of the seven uh, top seven evaluation criteria for next generation MDM, that's the de facto architecture we wanna see in our MDM solutions. Now graph technology has been around a while. Uh, Franco's, you know, uh, Neo4j, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bunch of different graph technologies out there. And just like there were a bunch of SQL or SQL databases originally, there is now some standard efforts to unify a common query language. Uh, there are some other um, efforts to, to uh, congeal or create um, a, a, a more or less um, industry robust set of capabilities that comprise a graph database in particular. Okay, so a graph database, as you probably know, allows us to manage very complex and hidden relationships and or hidden relationships. <clears throat> and in particular, it's very good at doing analytics across the relationships, the intersection of these domains. And so it's, it's very good for modeling the real world. In fact, it's a simplistic way to model the real world compared to the foreign and primary key, uh, key relational database data models we had historically. So when we look at graph technology, it does provide a, an ease of use in terms of working with uh, the stakeholders, the business users. It does provide a lot of power and flexibility. Uh, there have been some concerns about the scalability when we get into large scale systems in terms of inserts and deletes, et cetera. So we have seen a lot of, of um, if you like, analytical MDM or batch style MDM capabilities with the initial graph capabilities. But again, this is a key technology. It's a query that has to be there. It's, a, um, it's an interface, a UI, a UX that has to be there So because the users expect a Google-like or LinkedIn or Facebook-type interface. And, you know, when we look at, you know, a Google search system or Facebook or LinkedIn, we, we see what a graph database functions as, you know, how it, it can manage those relationships and follow and traverse the intersections, the planes, and so on. So graph database... The graph technology itself, you know, the UI and the underlying database, uh, which sometimes can be separate, sometimes together, the UI and the underlying database. This is providing the missing link between uh, domains so we can crosswalk among customer and product, for example. And it also provides big data analytics and also gives us some, for, um, if you like, foray or entree into Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything Else, as some people might call it. Now, big data, we all know as data, you know, uh, data management professionals that big data is simply the ongoing slog that we've had all of our professional lives where things are getting deeper, more complex, and lots more of it. So, you know, big data for however you feel about it uh, evangelically or in terms of um, dogma, you know, it's here, it's coming, and it's going to continue to impact our, our systems as well as our, our customer and our stakeholder experiences. <clears throat> the problem is that most organizations are, are getting about a 30 or 60 or 90 degree view of their customer, product, supplier, citizen, et cetera. So the challenge is to get rid of those, those, those blind spots and to be able to bring in data out of the big data, sometimes which is not in um, a tagged um, metadata uh, tagged type of format. And we have to be able to either 
after the fact, go in and tag that, that uh, big data, or we have to tag it as it streams into the data lakes and so on. And so there's a challenge. Okay, how do we how do we reincorporate big data, which is sort of strayed from the structured view of IT? Um, you know, it's vastly unstructured for most organizations. How do we reconcile that, repatriate that back, so that that data provides and rounds out and augments the so-called you know single view of X, where this customer, product, supplier, citizen, good guy, bad guy, whatever. So we find that big data is key. We find that MDM provides the capability to do identity resolution, that is to match the data over in the big data lakes or data marts, et cetera, with the data in your master data systems along with your transactional and analytical uh, uh, subsystems. So it's very important that big data be there to allow us, you know, I'm sorry, that, that MDM comes along to crosswalk, if you like, across the domains again, to link the domains, and also to even clean up and tag the data going into the data lakes. Now, AI and machine learning, likewise, something that's been around a long time. I don't know about you, but, you know, 30 years ago, I did my degrees. And back then, we were doing, you know, neural nets and all sorts of AI fun things. The challenge was the compute power and the databases needed to train these systems. Now, it was, it was just, it was pretty funky back then in my old age, uh, early age experience. So where we are now is we have, you know, AI being used for data profiling, to understand the relationships as a sophisticated software crawls across your, your data landscape to, to identify the relationships and the sources and targets and so on. Uh, we also have uh, AI, artificial intelligence, coming along to assist as sort of an expert system in the AI language or parlance to have an expert system to help data governance stewards in their day-to-day -day work to eliminate a lot of that repetitive work that they have to do and to also capture it so that it becomes rules in an expert system. So clearly, you know, AI machine learning is needed to help us get there when we have these more complex and larger, much larger uh, data landscapes and much, com much more complex data landscapes. Okay? And so not just the, the, the data scalability, but the human side for us to be able to, to deal with this as, as um, architects, as users, as data stewards or subject matter experts and so on. So it's not going to replace, it's basically going to augment and, and make us do what we do better, faster, easier. So when we have a bottom line thought about machine learning, it's really all about scalability, complexity, and agility, which are some of the problems being solved by machine learning when it comes to data management, especially governance and master data management. So action enablement, you know, it's, it's one thing to have analytics tell us something, it's another to turn those analytics into action. And in order to do action, you need some sort of workflow integration uh, with your operational systems, with the UI, the UX on mobile platforms, set tops, car dashes, et cetera. And so action enablement says we need to somehow bring back together business process management, robotic process automation, et cetera, to bring that stuff back together because the process management tools need data, and the data management tools need process management. And heretofore, they've sort of gone their separate ways architecturally and religious uh, origins and so on as how they've split and, and diverted. Uh, so how do we bring it back together? Well, you'll see that many of the modern uh, MDM platforms have sophisticated workflow built in and workflow that's able to integrate with the enterprise workflow as well, not just to kick off an email or a semaphore or something, but also to be able to integrate at multiple levels, RSS, Java message, you name it. Uh, you know, it has to be there. And so action enablement is a critical capability that we see in the more modern MDM platforms, but also as a retrofit, you know, when IBM buys various BPM vendors and Informatica and Oracle, you know, they're basically making all that work as well. Meanwhile, we've got people like TIBCO and, and other uh, BPM software AG, other BPM vendors that have also started blending in MDM into their overall platform for BPM. So the thought on action enablement, our bottom line thought is that from the enterprise perspective, if we're going to have a real modern MDM solution, then we want rules and we want reference data and we want metadata, we want it all to be applied across domains, and that requires some good amount of workflow or process automation. On our next chart, last chart for me, it looks like, 
uh, in terms of the seven. I uh, could have numbered these, and that would have been better for all of us. But in terms of uh, information governance and compliance, okay, so we all know that you know data governance is people, process, technologies, all that happy stuff that allow us to administer, you know, functionally the the uh, the management of our data assets. You know, uh, capture them, grow them, uh, retire them, manage them, et cetera. And so, data governance itself needs that end-to-end -end life cycle capability. And we need to be able to onboard data and then uh, roll it off, et cetera, at, at the end of a seven-year or other legal life. And likewise, we need workflows that will support, you know, bimodal, both, both IT-specific and business user-specific uh, capabilities. And we're going to see that the data governance vendors that were out there here before, uh, including Calibra, who just got, what, I guess another $100 million yesterday or so, and are now valued at a $1 billion or a unicorn, Calibra, but look at them. They don't have the MDM integration, okay? And so what we do need is MDM and data governance integration, and that's what you're going to see in a modern data management platform. You're going to see sufficient data governance <coughs> to also drive the MDM side and likewise sufficient MDM to drive the data governance. I mean, what's, what's the use of doing data governance if the end result is a, another PDF, Excel, Visio, whatever? You know, you need action. You need integration, uh, proactive integrated data governance with MDM. And so that's what we're talking about here is that the mega vendors themselves, you know, their, their, their solution, as well as a lot of other data governance platforms, has been, you know, uh, CSV, Excel type, input, input output type uh, integration, as opposed to round trip push a button or round trip hyper integration through RSS, JMS, or whatever it might be, uh, to give us that integrated data governance capability for our data assets. So a possible action plan for the next two years, um, we all know that we should be uh, promoting MDM as a business strategy, not as an IT refresh. Okay, so we, you know, we find the low-hanging fruit, we go out there, you know, cross-channel cross marketing, omni-channel marketing, data governance, you know, compliance, those sort of things. So fine, it's a business strategy. Uh, we also want it to be more than just reporting and communication. You know, it's got to be operational at some point. Now, it's okay to start out with reporting and analytics and compliance, but we need to get into operational transaction as well. You're probably going to start either with a party or thing, either with customer, citizen, or with, with a product supplier uh, pricing, et cetera. And we should, while we're evaluating our, evaluating our MDM capabilities, we need to keep our eyes out on the radar in terms of what's the next two years, mixing metaphors there a little bit. We need to look at, you know, not what we need now, but also what's going to be hitting us in the next two years in terms of this increased uh, move into, uh, you know, digital everything. And so it was not just from the, the mobile experience, the handheld experience, but likewise the integration of IoT for certain industries and likewise the integration of, of um, just the, the uh, complex extended supply chains that comprise the modern corporation. I mean, they, those systems, whether you're Apple, HP, IBM, Lenovo, whoever, you've got a lot of business partners in your supply chain that you have to integrate with. And that's a huge challenge. I mean, you're not just a, a solo entity. These days, you know, you're, you're hyper, you're being increasingly integrated with the rest of the world. You know, we're not just talking about, you know, Amazon or Yahoo or eBay doing your, 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 uh, your, your website or your company and you running the brick and mortar operational and analytical systems. You know, it's not that way. We're talking about your whole supply chain being increasingly, call it fragmented, call it deconstructed, you know, where we get the best price, where we get the best capabilities, and where we get the needed capabilities to address the consumer or the business user's requirements. So when you're looking at MDM these days, you may use certain MDM just to do reference data or just to do compliance. But if you're looking at an enterprise level solution, you're gonna be looking at multiple domains, you're gonna be looking at linking that together, you're gonna to be looking at making that a modern system as opposed to a legacy architecture where you don't have data governance integrated, where you don't have workflow integrated, where you don't have graph. You know, modern data management, here we've given you seven evaluation criteria or seven uh, capabilities that you can use to have uh, conversations to structure your confirmation, uh, your conversation with the various people uh, that you you interact with, whether it's your 
your, your implementation partner, whether it's your software supplier, uh, this is a good outline to, to structure a conversation, seven uh, good things that we need to know about. And so, again, to revisit the concept, in my 30 or so minutes here, I'm at the 25-minute mark, so I'm doing pretty good. Um, all enterprises need to focus on next-gen requirements because we're moving from the, the older system of record, golden record, customer 360, et cetera, to system of reference. And increasingly, we're ultimately moving into a system of engagement. All those transactions, all those interactions that we have to analyze, that we have to manage, and increasingly the, the, the dirty detail that we'll get into IoT. Now, relationship-driven analytics implies graph, okay, because the older relational database systems and hierarchy management systems, et cetera, don't do the relationship-driven that we need, the, the analytics and, and, the, uh, and the UI, the user uh, interface. And so this implies graph is something that we need in order to have those uh, cognitive apps and in order to help ourselves move into the next generation of digital enterprise, what that's going to look like. Where can you get more? Well, my organization for 15 years has been doing summits around the world. Uh, we do like mm, three, five, 5,000 people a year, uh, Singapore, Tokyo, et cetera, Sydney. And uh, there you go, that's us. And again, here's where you can find my organization, myself on Twitter, on LinkedIn, phone, email, et cetera. So now I'd like to hand it off to, uh, I was surprised to hear the job title VP of Marketing because I think of AJ Khanna as, as, as a very technical, savvy guy who's been in the market for a long time. But uh, so I'll just call him a RELTIO's representative to discuss use cases relative to the seven uh, evaluation criteria for modern data management. Okay, AJ? Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was really, really uh, exciting uh, discussions that uh, uh, that uh, you just kind of went through. And it's, it's a really exciting time to be in data management, right? I mean, data is no longer just uh, an exhaust coming from various applications and system. Now we are uh, we all kind of consider it as a enterprise asset. So, so yeah, um, I'm I'm pretty excited to be in this space at this point in time. So, uh, thank you for. Uh, uh, the uh, seven uh, uh, core capabilities for next gen. So, the attempt from my side here is to kind of uh, uh, discuss some of the use cases and uh, some how these uh, technologies are coming together in uh, in a modern master data management platform. So let's uh, go and get started. And I see a lot of messages from. Uh, from uh, people uh, which are from really cold areas. So friends, please stay warm from Chicago, from Boston, <laughs> and from St. Petersburg. Uh, so let's go and get started here. So when uh, we speak of uh, modern data management or modern data management platform, so it uh, goes beyond uh, core MDM capabilities of matching and merging and uh, creating that single source of truth. We also talk about including graph, as Aaron mentioned, to find the relationships, just like LinkedIn, finding the relationships between uh, customers and the products and the stores and the parts and the suppliers, or some of you guys who are in uh, coming from life sciences and pharma space into this session, it will be uh, finding the relationships between a physician and the hospital system, patient and the plans and the payers and the prescriptions, so on and so forth. So just like LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, it provides a new context uh, across various uh, data domains. Next is workflow and collaboration capabilities, uh, very BPM-like. You can design your processes about data change requests, data deletion requests, data access requests, especially when they are mandated by regulations like CCP or GDPR. We must adhere to those. Uh, analytics and machine learning, uh, not just to uh, get next best actions like you would see in uh, Netflix or Amazon. People who like this would also like to buy this, but also improving the data governance part, also improving the data quality, also improving the data matching uh, within your system. Uh, data as a service where you may want to consume third-party data, how easily you can consume third-party data from vendors like Dun & Bradstreet or in life sciences vendors like IQV or Metpro. So those are the capabilities uh, that uh, are required today as part of the model platform and then deliver that information to business users for action enablement. That's where you deliver all that information to the business user in form of these data-driven applications where they can actually view the profiles, where they 
can actually work on various uh, uh, tasks generated by uh, workflow they can where they can do the collaboration and get insights uh, into the information about certain profiles as well as certain relationships and uh, as uh, uh, Aaron mentioned that we need to deliver this as a big data scale uh, bringing in omnichannel interactions and transactions and uh, incorporating some of the newer technologies like microservices architectures containers using kubernetes so that we can uh, uh, leverage this multi-cloud architecture so I will get into a little bit more uh, 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 details into each of these. So first, let's see how these things kind of come together and work. So I'm starting with point number one from the left-hand side. The first step is to organize your data. So you connect to various data sources, your internal, external, third-party data sources, uh, like Dun & Bradstreet or IQVIA, for, or from your CRM systems, or even like public data, right? Whether it is data like N NPI data or uh, or any kind of like uh, data from, uh, uh, from you know, postal services. And then you merge that data together and uh, refine and reconcile to create those uh, 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 consolidated profiles and then find the relationships relays, uh, relate those entity peoples to people people to products products to locations to stores etc and also correlate that with omnichannel transactions and interactions so if it is a consumer what have they purchased what have been their web visits what kind of emails they have opened so all that information is also correlated with the master profiles to create that true views and then seamlessly made it available to the underlining analytical system where the machine learning, whether it is Spark based or whether it is in GBQ kind of uh, environment, is uh, utilized to gain further insights about that information, create further insights about that data, and uh, bring those insights back, bring those insights back to as part of the master profiles. And then as a step number three, visualize that information in the contextual view, uh, whether you want to deliver that view to your uh, marketing people or uh, account reps or field service agents or call center agents, deliver that view about that product or the customer or a consumer or a supplier in procurement in the context of their business uh, rules. So everybody get uh, the uh, the relevant uh, view which is uh, uh, which is as per their business goals and objectives and then uh, also uh, making it more operational uh, so all this information is then made available to your downstream uh, any kind of like analytical or operational systems so when we talk about uh, uh, storage approach so there is a lot of different type of data and uh, which is uh, which is uh, uh, relational and for uh, which is kind of RDBMS type and then we want to maintain uh, relationships which is more suited for graph databases then we have a lot of interaction transactional information then we have a data on big data scale for which you want to use maybe something like NoSQL Cassandra so an approach uh, an ideal approach will be this multi-model data approach where you store different type of data in the storage which is right for that particular uh, data type and uh, whether we are storing relationships in graphs and then reference data in something relational like RDBMS we have uh, interaction omnichannel transactional files in some storage like uh, uh, s3 uh, uh, or and related to those records and then bringing all this together in a contextual way where you can uh, provide relevant information and create those uh, reliable data profiles of any kind of data entity, whether it is a customer or a B2B organization or a supplier or a product. So specifically talking about the graph, uh, so what are the use cases, right? So here are some of the use cases that we see out there. First is uh, bringing in, for example, data from uh, Dun & Bradstreet to create legal hierarchy. So what is the hierarchy across this organization, uh, what are various business units uh, within this company, and then creating uh, custom views of those hierarchies. Uh, I want uh, a product penetration view of my customer, or I want to see what are the uh, green spaces and white spaces in my customer organization uh, where I can do more upsell and cross-sell or I want to create a, a hierarchy where I can manage my sales alignment, my zip to territory to product kind of alignments, or I want to do risk roll-ups, or I want to do value roll-ups across the hierarchy. So when you have this graph technology and have these relationship across various entities, now you can do very sophisticated uh, 
uh, hierarchy management uh, within uh, within your data profiles. And then some ad hoc kind of for use cases where you want to create a profile of your customer, B2B customer, and you want to see uh, uh, what is my account team like or what is um, uh, the procurement team or approval team like in my customer uh, organization or in life sciences so how does the formulary team looks like and so all those kind of uh, relationships can be used to create these teams and committees which then become part of your master data profiles and then some of the other use cases around affiliations and relationships are uh, to uh, do identity resolution uh, or to find an influencer within your network like who is the most uh, influential or key opinion leader in this disease area or who is my most important uh, uh, influencer in my B2B customer who should I talk to or who can introduce me to this particular person what kind of new product should be recommending to this particular person and uh, so so these are the kind of uh, use cases and even householding for example in retail where they want to understand that okay i'm marketing to this particular person but uh, what does the family look like i mean is this person married do they have kids and then based on those insights you can ma market much more personalized offer much more contextual offers to your customers so householding is another important uh, use case uh, uh, for using graphs Getting into uh, machine learning, uh, so some of the things that we see out there are like uh, the lot of companies are investing a lot into data science and bringing on data scientists. And the challenge has been that uh, data scientists are spending 70 to 80 percent of their time uh, doing data cleanups or doing ETLs. So the whole idea here is, first of all, um, making that reliable data available uh, uh, for these data scientists so that they can run their algorithms and uh, in an agile way, in kind of like shared uh, uh, object way where you can, if you add more data attributes to your MDM profile, those are easily available uh, to, uh, to the uh, analytics data models and the data scientists can just focus on their uh, algorithms and bringing that business value and when they get those insights back, it, in a closed loop, those insights or those recommendations are pushed back to those master profiles or those, those actionable applications for business users. For the use cases side, uh, we see these three category of use cases. One is uh, around business use cases, which is in the center, uh, getting the next best action that, okay, uh, what is the right channel to engage uh, with this particular customer, whether it's a consumer or whether it is a physician in life sciences or what should be the next product to recommend to this particular person through which channel or what should be the next offer. So those are the kind of business use cases where you need these reliable data and integrated machine learning algorithms to make those recommendations. Uh, and then uh, uh, finding those relationships, suggesting new relationship. And then third is around data quality. So this is like uh, really important uh, that how to use uh, machine learning to improve the data quality itself. So the first use case of machine learning is, is uh, to use the data to improve that data. Uh, where you can use it to score your profiles, rank your profiles. What I mean by that is, uh, uh, for example, you can uh, score your profile for data quality. That if I have a consumer profile, I mean, have we done the address verification? Do we have the all all of our the data that we require? Have we done email verification or phone verifications? Do we have the right licensing information, NPI numbers for this particular profile? So all that things can be uh, uh, collated and given a score where you can see that what is the completeness or richness or of this particular record from the data quality perspective or you can rank the profile from business value perspective right so is this uh, is this the right uh, uh, target segment for me what is the business value for this particular customer and then you can juxtapose these values business values and data quality ranks to see where should your data stewards focus uh, uh, on on to the people who have high value but low scores and then how your marketing should be using this data for better segmentation to run the next campaign by using these scores and rank and identifying other data issues suggesting new matching rules so that's how uh, we see some of these use cases where machine learning is being used to improve the data quality itself so now, uh, just kind of going a little bit back here. So 
uh, before we move forward. Uh, so here is like uh, now uh, we are creating these profiles, whether it is for a person or an organization or a product, we need to connect to multiple data sources, right? Internal, external, third party data sources, but as part of the governance, as part of uh, 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 the whole audit history and transparency requirements today, we need to make sure that we have the right data lineage that, okay, which data is coming from which particular data source, and if we are using particular attribute value, why did we use that? Where did we use it? Where did we get it from? And it is important from data quality perspective, and it is also important from compliance reporting perspective. So we are bringing all this data together from internal, external, and third-party data sources, and then correlating that with omnichannel interactions and transactions so that we can get the complete view of profile for action enablement. Now your profile has information regarding the demographics, if it is a person, regarding the particular insights, what is their channel preference, what is their product preference, what kind of products they have purchased in the past, using relationship, what kind of households do they belong to, using relationships you can see what kind of devices they use to visit my websites, or, uh, uh, or, or uh, what are the various uh, interests that they have, and again, providing various scores, like what is the data quality score, what is the business value of this particular profile, what should we recommend them next. Uh, so all those things are becoming coming together so that you can now provide this information to your field service who is making uh, maybe going to do a, a house visit for fixing something or it is uh, this information is delivered to your point of sale system so that your store uh, uh, um, a person can print out a relevant coupon or it is to call center agents. So this information becomes much more actionable. So this is kind of bringing together the analytical aspect as well as the operational aspect of these profile together to provide that actionability. And then uh, last piece I would <coughs> uh, hit on is the whole idea of governance and compliance, uh, including BPM kind of capabilities where you can design uh, BPM and 2.0 based process models uh, uh, so that uh, you can kick off these workflows whenever the data change requests come from your uh, field users, from your business users, and even be able to uh, push these requests to your third party data providers, right? So, so these kind of processes which kick off uh, certain uh, 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 processes which kick off these, uh, these workflows for uh, review of data changes and then once the data change request is reviewed uh, if, and approved, it goes to the data steward, they make those changes and then persist those changes so that your data is continuously, um, uh, data quality is continuously maintained, your data is continuously improving uh, and you are uh, uh, addressing all the requests uh, as per mandated regulations such as GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, uh, where uh, you want to manage the customer data in a proper way. You want to understand that where did the consent come from, where did the data value come from. Again, this is where the graph technology comes into play. This is where the correlation with interactions and transactions come into play, as well as information governance come into play, where you want to address some of the customer change requests like access to data, requests like uh, uh, data changes, requests like uh, uh, data deletion requests, uh, right to be forgotten. So all those things uh, can be possible once we are kind of bringing these things together in a, in a modern mass data management way, where you are leveraging correlated transactions, where you are leveraging uh, uh, graph technology, where you are leveraging workflow and BPM kind of capabilities in a one, in, in kind of like cohesive way. So at a uh, uh, higher level, uh, I have like a couple more minutes left. So at a higher level, if you see some of the industry use cases in the life sciences, uh, you will be uh, thinking of these technologies to maintain reliable healthcare provider profiles or, or hospital data, healthcare organization, HCO profiles. You want to understand the affiliations across uh, plans and payers and HCPs and HCOs and patients and prescriptions and even uh, uh, compliant product 360 uh, with, uh, with IDMP compliance or even uh, later on managing patient experience which also leads to healthcare use cases where you want to maintain right patient experience, right member experience, as well as maintaining the uh, uh, reliable provider directories as per CMS, uh, Center of Medicare and Medicaid uh, 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 compliance purposes. 
and then a lot of use cases in retail are around digital transformation are around <clears throat> delivering the connected uh, customer experience uh, uh, across the buyer's journey uh, are around addressing the household issues as well as uh, uh, adhering to use cases or regulations such as GDPR and very similar use cases you will see in financial and insurance industries as well and some in like high to high tech kind of industry where the selling is mostly B2B uh, it is understanding the hierarchy of their B2B customers doing hierarchy management uh, uh, maintaining the sales alignment calculating the uh, sales or distributor or distributor compensation sales effectiveness and uh, even supplier 360 kind of scenarios where you want to create complete profiles of suppliers and to see who is your top most supplier or who which supplier or is the supplier uh, maintaining the right compliance uh, requirements so all those kind of uh, use cases are are uh, uh, can be addressed uh, by bringing these uh, technologies together. So these are just a sample of use cases, and definitely we can discuss uh, more when we dive, deep dive into a single industry. So just kind of a recap, the idea is to make uh, data heart of every decision by organizing the data, whether it is internal, external, third-party data, or interactions and transactions, bringing it together, understanding the relationships, and then delivering that information to business users for actionability in personalized views, infusing analytics using uh, machine learning or AI as part of those business processes, and then using that information to continuously improve your data, continuously improve the customer experience, continuously improve the business outcomes. And uh, the idea is for your organizations to gain competitive advantage, better provide better customer experience, improve the operational efficiencies within the organization, and then reduce uh, uh, compliance uh, risk across the organization. So with that, I will end my presentation, and if you want to learn more, definitely you can contact us at any time or visit relty.com. Uh, we will also be at a conference called Modern Data Management Summit in San Francisco, so registrations are still open. If you are in the area or if you are interested, definitely go to the website and uh, see what all, all this is about. And we will be discussing some of these use cases with some of the top pharmaceutical companies and top retailer and consumer and uh, high-tech industries in that conference as well. So that's it from my side. Uh, Shannon, uh, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you both to AJ and Aaron for this great presentation. Uh, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days, so by end of day Monday, with links to the slides and recording of this presentation. Um, by end of day Monday to everybody. And if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We did have a question come in earlier. Uh, so one of the major complexities in MDM is growing uh, is growing list of sus uh, suspect match pools. How do we tackle it in new gen MDM? Uh, so I can uh, take that one and then Aaron definitely uh, please provide your thoughts as well. So I mean there are multiple ways uh, for suspect matches or uh, uh, what we also call like potential matches. So there are kind of discrete rules then there are fuzzy logic and smart matching rules and uh, uh, you can also use machine learning to improve that matching as well. So for example uh, there are uh, uh, you added a new data source and there is a match happening and system says that this is maybe like like a 60% match. In that particular case, but it is not a high confidence level, these kind of matches will go to a data steward. They can eyeball it uh, and say that, okay, uh, we should merge these records. And then system in the background is learning and identifying those patterns and then saying that, okay, you have been merging such kind of records. So this is a new rule that we will suggest. Do you want to persist this rule? So that is one part. Uh, of improving your matching using uh, machine learning. And then second aspect is graph is, as well, right? So for example, if we do not have uh, uh, this kind of fuzzy matching and, uh, and uh, we do not have like uh, uh, right keys, but we can use relationships that this person uh, like John Smith and Jonathan Smith and Jay Smith uh, uh, has the same relationship with the same person in the same kind of zip code. So even though the data is different, maybe this is the same person and uh, we want to uh, train our machine learning to identify these relationships as well to improve those uh, suspect matches. 
Yeah, historically, Aaron here. Uh, historically, we've had both database driven or data driven and um, and probability driven matching. Okay, and so that has been the historical means. And sometimes the various MDM platforms would use one or the other. Uh, the trend now is to use both. Mm-hmm. Okay, that is, you know, to match against historical databases for accuracy, synonyms, whatever. And likewise, to use um, thresholds, probabilities, et cetera, to fine tune a system, which you know over time will change in terms of what is a, a suspect, perhaps, or, or what is a duplicate, or what is a false positive, or whatever. So we've got a number of ways that we could do this. Now, the good news is that you know machine learning, AI, and all that, which is not the end all to everything, but it is being applied to help train these, to create these databases. Um, if you like to curate the databases for the, the um, the deductive uh, matching versus the probabilistic matching. Uh, the probabilistic matching, those rules are often, or increasingly, I should say, are being determined or found by um, our expert systems, by the, the machine learning processes themselves. So these are areas, again, where, where AI and machine learning can help us do better than what we've done in the past, do it faster, do it more accurate, and make it take those mundane tasks out of our hands, but at the same time kick it out as an exception where appropriate so that, you know, a steward or analyst can review the suspect to make sure that it does either modify the rule or does go in the right database or not go in the database for onboarding, et cetera. Next question. Yeah, everyone's very quiet today, so if you have questions, put them in the bottom right-hand corner, but we've got some other questions here. Do you really need modern MDM for GDPR? Uh, Aaron, you want to take that? Um, well, there are various degrees of compliance with GDPR, yeah. and um, like a lot of American companies are sort of sticking their head in the sand, even though they're doing business in Europe, especially smaller companies because of the, the cost of uh, just uh, bringing in consultants and determining how much GDPR capability we need to, to continue our business in Europe or whether we should drop Europe um, because it's the cost of servicing Europe versus the cost of GDPR uh, compliance for Europe. But anyway, back to the big question. You can do GDPR with any number of tools. I mean, we, we've had all these, you know, um, we've had anti-money laundering databases, good guy, bad guy, watch lists, all this sort of stuff in the, in the past. Uh, MDM itself is, you know, fundamental to GDPR. You know, where do we have data on what? Who's allowed to access it? When was the last access? You know, the audit trails, um, the protections of the data, et cetera, the ability to tell a customer, you know, that this is where we're keeping data on you and why we're keeping it, the ability to purge a customer when you get a forget request, okay, from a European consumer, et cetera. So these are all classical capabilities that are simply magnified um, when you get into a GDPR scenario. And um, I'll, I'll pass it over to, to um, AJ at this point. But again, MDM, any, any fundamental MDM can do it. Uh, the good news is that with Graph, we're able to suss out a lot of relationships of other data sources about that individual or entity that we weren't necessarily uh, in, uh, explicitly aware of. You know, the hidden relationships and the hidden data files that are out there that when we get audited, you know, we get in trouble. So I'll pass it over to AJ just to carry on that thought. Uh, thanks, Aaron, and, and I agree, right? I mean, uh, uh, so you can go ahead and do the basics, but the whole idea is that uh, understanding uh, the data lineages as well, right? How easily we can understand that, okay, if a customer asks that, okay, where did you get this consent from, right? I mean, which is uh, permissible in GDPR, we need to be able to tell them that, okay, you provided me this consent from this particular website or this particular digital asset, or for example, so that kind of information you need to uh, be able to provide uh, pretty quickly. Or if uh, you are interacting with a minor, for example, like a 12 year or a 15 year old kid, you need to say that okay, which parent gave consent for that particular uh, particular interaction, uh, whether it is for healthcare purposes or whether it is uh, or for other commercial things, and so that's where the uh, whole idea of graph technology also comes into play to manage that particular uh, uh, consent and be able to trace 
back and see that where did that particular constant came from or where did that particular attribute value uh, came from. And uh, as, as we discussed earlier, that having a little bit sophisticated uh, uh, business process management kind of capabilities, workflow and governance capabilities are also required as part of, uh, of these uh, systems. And then propagating that information back to downstream systems so that uh, we can uh, either eliminate that data or anonymize that data as per the requirements is is uh, uh, is, is required as per GDPR. So, making the system more efficient to meet GDPR requirement, I think that that is the key. How how well we can adhere to the requirement and how easy we can make it for our customers uh, as well as for our data stewards and business users and marketing users. Uh, uh, making it easier for them to co be compliant and be confident that when they are running their campaigns, they are they are pretty uh, uh, they are following the regulations and they are compliant. So I think that is that is the essence as well. So one of the major complexities in MDM is drawing lists of suspect match pools. So how do we tackle it in the new gen MDM? Uh, I think that is. Oh, we, we, yeah, he's uh, sorry. He's just repeating his <laughs> question there. So we kind of tackled that already. <laughs> yes. I'm just rereading questions. Um, no, so let me move on then. Um, so, so what are some of the early adopter industries for modern MDM? Uh, the ones that we're allowed to talk about are uh, the retailers, or especially online retailers. Um, we, of course, we can't talk about certain government functions, but you could imagine that there's a lot going on to, to track down bad guys and uh, the relationships among bad guys across uh, many different uh, operational systems. Um, but in terms of the early adopters, uh, in classic MDM, the early adopters were telco, uh, finance, you know, financial services, banking, insurance, uh, high tech, and so and pharma. Okay, so we've seen. I, I don't know. I think AJ has seen a lot of pharma stuff with his company. I'll, so I'll pass it over to him. But those were the classical MDM early adopters, and from my experience, watching uptake of of products like Realtio, uh, I've seen a lot of pharma, in particular, a lot of uh, biotech. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you're right, Aaron. That uh, we uh, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, quick adoption on life sciences side, whether it is pharma, biotech, medical devices, and and again the relationship played a big role there because they want to under they, they want to have the right data, uh, of course, because of uh, their marketing purposes or even for compliance and reporting like Sunshine Act and all, but they also want to understand the relationships uh, between uh, physicians and hospital systems and uh, payer organizations and plans and prescriptions and patients. So that uh, that has been there. And uh, then another one is, as you pointed out, is retail, where they want to have that connected customer experience. They want to uh, provide better personalization. They want to provide uh, better contextual offers, as well as making sure that they are meeting all the compliance needs and understanding the households within their consumer base. So, so that has been a uh, uh, big adopter. And then similar use cases we see are around the healthcare as well as uh, PNC insurance where where we are, uh, where our customers have been saying that, okay, we want to be more customer-centric than policy-centric organization to understand the customer, to understand their needs, and then delivering more customized products uh, for those particular customers. So, so that is another uh, big one that has been uh, in the forefront of uh, adopting uh, uh, these modern technologies. And we just have a couple of minutes left. I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, how easy is the path to upgrade the, to the new gen MDM from the existing traditional? I'll take that uh, for sure. a high level. Thanks, AJ. Real quick, um, we're talking about graph often being a layer across uh, legacy systems, including legacy MDM, to pull everything back together, to do crosswalk across domains, to find hidden relationships, explicit, implicit, whatever. You know, to go from product to, to customer to supplier to pricing, so which are often in discrete MDM systems or commonly in discrete systems. So Graph often provides a glue to bring things back together as you migrate to the next level or next generation platform. Back to AJ. 
Uh, exactly right. I think uh, I was going to say the same thing. So it is not uh, necessarily kind of a rip and replace kind of a, a, a solution, right? Uh, like any other good solution should do. So it is more like uh, bringing your information from your legacy systems together and then providing uh, uh, that uh, that kind of a, uh, a step approach towards moving on to these modern technologies. So you can kind of bring uh, the data from your old systems, whether it is uh, MDM or your old data warehouses, or even like sometimes the data lakes we are seeing out there, and then fulfilling a business purpose. And then as you move along, then you can kind of uh, say, that, okay, you want to kind of uh, move uh, the data from your old legacy system into into the new system as well. But it is more of like a, a phase approach where you can still continue, but pull the data from your older systems uh, into the new one, and then in a phased manner, remove the older systems. All right, well, that brings us to the top of the hour. Aaron and AJ, thank you so much for this great presentation, and thanks to RailTO for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, just again, reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording. And we, I hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye.